So, Daniel, let's go back to the question on the economic uh, impact, because as we were saying, this crisis is not only a health crisis. Uh, even, if, even though there have been a lag on the continent, um, you know, it has cut, this has caught up. We had had first the economic impact before seeing the real crisis, uh, health crisis. Now we are both in the health crisis and the economic uh, crisis. So you had started talking to us about uh, your the economic response uh, the MasterCard Foundation is helping the continent uh, deal with. Would you please go back to that? Absolutely, absolutely. So, so my, micro, uh, medium enterprises um, or MSMEs um, are key area focus. Foundation, COVID nineteen, the um, the role that MSMEs play as a source of economic activity and employment on the continent. So, keeping them going is critical in sustaining the livelihood of millions across the continent. Uh, we also know that you know these these enterprises have significantly been impacted by the lockdowns and other safety measures um, that have been put in place by governments across the uh, the continent. Um, and so the impacts have, have, have basically resulted in, in supply chains being disrupted, um, and and ultimately market demand for these micro enterprises has shrunk significantly. So we know well that even in ordinary times, these businesses have significant challenges in accessing financing from traditional um, commercial institutions. So COVID-19 has really exasperated that reality for them. Uh, we're working today with a, with a myriad of partners across the continent, um, and specifically here in, in, on, the, in, on this side of the continent, to deploy instruments that will offer flexible um, solutions um, to offer credit lines um, um, during this key period when ultimately you know it's it's about making sure that these businesses are able to stay um, um, in business or at least are able to sustain themselves until they can actually get back into the market. So the uh, the need is not just financial either. Um, it's important that we recognize um, it's one thing to have the actual financing that you need to pay to pay the bills, whether it's the, uh, the bills for the real estate side of it or, or your supply chain. But the other one is to actually have the knowledge um, on how you manage through such a, such a scenario. So, so we're also offering, together with our um, uh, funding financing instruments, technical assistance to, to small enterprises as well. MSMEs um, need this kind of comprehensive support to tide them over um, until the crisis is, is abated. Um, and, and, and based on current predictions, you know, that, that looks like a, a lengthy period. So we're really focusing on making sure that we're building the resilience of these enterprises so that they can not just withstand this shock, because um, we suspect that um, as time goes on, there'll be other other reasons that uh, business is disrupted. So resilience really comes into play as a key element of what we're trying to deliver to these enterprises. Um, ultimately, you know, these supports mechanisms that we're enabling, we're deploying, um, not only protect, you know, these businesses today, uh, but there, we also recognize the direct linkage into our broader and bigger strategy around Young Africa Works and, and ensuring that young people have the opportunity to access dignified and fulfilling work. So, so there's a strong linkage here in terms of what we're doing in response to COVID-19, uh, but also going back to our, to our Young Africa Works strategy. Um, so just, I'll give one example for the time being, and there'll be several more coming out, but in Ethiopia, we're working um, with our partner First Consult um, to secure funding, financing support for uh, the livelihood to support livelihoods of over 50,000 workers, um, and and this is just one one example of many that we'll be deploying across the continent and specifically here on this side as well. Yeah, and and we'll we'll, we'll come back to uh, Young Africa Works, but I, I would like now to turn to education, key for the continent, but also. An, an area in which your foundation, the Muscat Foundation, has invested a lot. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. um, <clears throat> one of the problems caused by COVID-19 is like children staying home in many countries. Almost all of them you know, on the continent, children are not going back, uh, are not going to school. And that unfortunately is impacted 
the hard-earned you know, gains which in many countries uh, we have experienced for some time now. What is the foundation doing specifically in this area to help, uh, uh, to help cope with this crisis uh, on the education? So yeah, education is, um, this, this was our mainstay um, in terms of the initial set of programs that we were delivering on um, going back to the first decade. So yeah, education really an area that we, we, we've seen the impact um, and we are seeing the possibility that this impact actually continue now. So I know that countries are, are, are managing through how they'll either reopen or reorganize themselves to be able to deliver education. But yes, absolutely a, a key part of um, the MasterCard Foundation COVID-19 Recovery and Resilience Program is, is to enable um, support for education, not just, again, basic education, but we're also looking at tertiary education as well. Um, first and foremost, we, we've stepped up um, to face the immediate needs facing students in our uh, MasterCard Foundation Scholars Program. Um, we have more than 35,000 students um, enrolled in MasterCard Foundation Scholar programs. Um, some of these students were caught um, very vulnerable with the, with, the on with the onset of the COVID-19 emergency. Um, and as a result of the disruption of education and travel, we've moved quickly to ensure the safety of all the students, um, that their, their basic needs are catered for, and they could shift seamlessly to online learning where, where their institution of, of um, learning is basically. Um, and so this is one, one part of it. Um, more broadly, and building on the work we have underway through the uh, MasterCard Foundation Center for Innovation and Technology, Innovative Teaching and Learning, um, we're now looking at how e-learning becomes the enabler that will not only bridge the gap um, that we're seeing and feeling today, um, but also becomes an enabler for how education can be delivered in a more impactful way across the continent in the future as well. So the, the response today uh, on the ground, if you were to say, okay, but what about today? Tomorrow's tomorrow, what about today? So in Rwanda, we're working with the education board um, to offer support um, um, for lessons that are taught basically by radio and television. Um, so again, recognizing that when we talk about e-learning and online learning, um, you know, we have a se severe disadvantage on the continent in terms of the rate of connectivity or device ownership. So, so being practical here and basically shifting the modality of delivery from from physical to one that is um, relatively accessible to to, uh, to a lot of people, a lot of students, which is again radio and television. Um, in Kenya, we're working with um, with a with an entity called CAP Youth Empowerment Institute to help deliver um, um, training around employability skills for TVET students. And again, be, being innovative here and, and and avoiding this gap where students stay home or stay away from their learning institutions for um, for two, three months and basically come back and are expected to plug right in and, and move forward. So looking to offer solutions that are practical and, and aligned with the realities on the ground and also keeping an eye on the fact that, that ultimately we recognize that you know this is this is an area that is um, a challenge originally just from the resource shortages that uh, basic education institutions face. And, and now is the opportunity that we feel to, to really support um, a transition and e-learning um, education technology are the tools that will enable this to happen. And uh, so it's a focus area for us. I mean, absolutely critical. I mean, you know, I couldn't agree more. I mean, education is a pillar to, you know, if you want to, to, to come back and come back stronger and uh, have a very good bet on the future of the continent, You've got to be doing something on the education, and and um, you know that that's that's absolutely great. I would like now to 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 have this discussion around uh, the the nature of your response and actually what what you really think. You you've started talking about it earlier, uh, but I would like a little bit for you to expand on it. Um, when you look at, of course, the continent is large and and uh, 54, 55 countries. Um, so what is in your opinion, the best approach to addressing the response of COVID-19? Should we be focusing on specific country needs 
Or is there some Pan-African approach which you think uh, need to be uh, uh, looked at here? And, and what is the foundation's view specifically on that? So we, so, so the MasterCard Foundation has, has experience uh, working um, at a regional level, um, so programs, interventions that are delivered at a regional level. But we've also evolved to, to a model where we're, we are focusing um, our delivery mechanism for Young Africa Works to focus on country level as well, country level specific, specific programming. Um, so we, we have experience in both. And, and I know that um, you know, the other, um, other organizations that are looking to support, I think, have similar experiences as well. I think you know the sheer scale of the COVID-19 reality, um, it, as we know it today and as it will continue to evolve, will require the adaptation of flexible response models. Um, so um, you know, in the case of the MasterCard Foundation's um, COVID-19 Recovery and Resilience Program, we will leverage a combination of country-specific and regional type programs. Um, Country-level programming allows us to deliver context-aligned um, grassroots reaching interventions. And this is really critical because again, we're we're looking to support vulnerable of the vulnerable. And, and in order to do that, there's a, there's a requirement, there's a need for you to have the ability to work at a grassroots level. And that, and that is, um, in my view, difficult to attain um, when you're working at a regional level. Having said that, regional programming allows us to leverage on economies of scale as well. Um, and th this is obviously a key trigger for making sure that um, whatever support we're able to provide or others can be maximized. Um, so I shared earlier a number of examples which are which were country specific, and I and I, and I specifically alluded to Kenya, uh, Rwanda, Uganda, Ethiopia. So I really focused on on the eastern side of the continent. Um, we're currently developing a number of regional programs as well with partners that have regional reach and delivery capacity. Um, and this is this is the key point here that regional programs need, require a different set of expertise um, to, to to succeed. And so we're we're working with partners that we feel have that um, capacity, capability, and reach. Um, and we hope to conclude formalizing some of these partnerships in the coming weeks, I would say. And uh, we'll be rolling those out again, just you know, making sure that we're we're doing what's practical. We're 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 advising ourselves on the basis of the need. Um, rather than uh, programming on what's comfortable, because I think if we, um, uh, you know, in terms of our response mechanism, comfortable versus what's needed are not always the same thing. So, so we're we're stretching, being flexible, pivoting as required, and um, really adapting to both models as needed.